Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We are just going to wait a couple more minutes as people start trickling in and then we will get started on today's webinar. We'll wait uh, another minute and then we'll get going. All right. Welcome everyone to uh, another Biomakers webinar. We've got an exciting one for you. Just a quick note before we get started, feel free to write your questions in as they come up and we will save the last 10 to 15 minutes to go over those. And feel free to take some notes as we go over today's webinar where we'll be discussing uh, monitoring the impact of cover crops on the soil microbiome in hemp. So today we have joining us Gus Plamen, the senior agronomist at Biomakers, as well as Steve Graf, region hemp farmer and CEO at Cedar Meadow Farm. So a little bit about Steve. Steve is a, a Lancaster County, Pennsylvania native. Steve Graf is a farmer, author, consultant, and speaker known internationally for his work in cover crops and no-till agriculture. Steve has a history of innovating and pioneering in the area of environmentally healthy farming practices. He's also the author of The Future Proof Farm, Changing Mindsets in a Changing World. A few fun facts about Steve. He designed the first roller crimper in North America, he developed the tillage radish, started the first company in the world exclusively selling cover crop seed, and the first commercial vegetable farm to no-till transplant tomatoes. He is a, a consultant for various uh, organizations and universities, including USDA, uh, NRCS, Rodale Institute, and multiple others. So thanks, Steve, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today for this webinar. My pleasure. So in this webinar, we are going to go over uh, understanding bee crop test management to gain an overview of how the bee crop test compares soil health across different farming practices and the insights it offers for regenerative agriculture. We'll also go into practical tools for soil management to discover data analysis tools and strategies that empower you to make informed decisions about soil health and quality. We'll learn to assess and improve farm operations with a focus on sustainability, yield optimization, and cost reduction, as well as cover cropping strategies. So we'll learn from the expert advice on the management of cover crops to improve soil structure, nutrient cycling, and biodiversity. So a little background about Biomakers. Biomakers was founded in California's Silicon Valley in 2015. Biomakers is one of the foremost global ag tech leaders, setting the standard in soil health with bee crop tech. We connect soil biology to agricultural decisions making uh, to optimize farming practices and reverse the degradation of arable soil. Our co-founders, Adrian and Alberto, built this technology to fill the gap within agriculture to help industry understand the biological functionality to the soil ecosystem and why it's so important to consider in decision making. Our headquarters are in California and we have a global team of 90 employees. So a little bit about bee crop tech. So 
Our technology is built to deliver complex biological information into actionable functional reports to better understand the soil ecosystem. At Biomakers, we extract the DNA from the soil. We have a bioinformatics pipeline that decodes the microbiome and we turn it into these functional reports that look at nutrient use efficiency, hormone production, disease risk and stress adaptation to take something really complex and turn it into something actionable. So a little about our uh, products and services. Bcrop is a sales enabler. So ultimately, our, the goal is add ROI to growers, retailers, ag manufacturers, and food companies. So with growers and retailers, we we use Bcrop tests to provide predictive insights on yield, disease, and sustainability to improve crop uh, quality and ROI. With retailers, we're helping with biological bottlenecks and provide precise recommendations. And then with ag manufacturers, our B-Crop trials help to measure the effects of ag inputs and support product development all the way to commercialization. Whereas with food companies, we have B-Crop rates, which helps with scope three reductions, strengthening supply chain resilience and evaluating sustainable land management. Our B-Crop test provides user-friendly reports on soil nutrient cycling, health, and biodiversity on any field to help with monitoring farm practices, predict disease risk, analyze yield improvements, and assess nutrient cycling. So Gus, I'll uh, hand it over to you. Thanks, Neil. So happy to uh, dive a little bit deeper into some of the metrics that Bcrop Technology provides. As, as Neil uh, mentioned, I'm, I'm a senior agronomist at the Biomakers team, and my role predominantly focuses on education and connecting uh, folks with the resources and understanding of our technology to leverage these soil biology insights into practices, into ag input product placement, and just into better understanding of the biological processes that um, ultimately support plant health, um, soil health, and of course, uh, human health at the end of the day. So um, with biomakers, you know, there's a lot of complexity in the soil microbiome. And also I have to apologize, there's some work, uh, roofing work going on here next door. So a little, hopefully not too much background noise from the construction. But um, anyways, on this slide, we have an overview of the three main categories we look at on B-crop tests, and we divide them into soil quality, plant health and nutrient cycling. Soil quality really looks at the overall microbiome taking into account every species that we detect. And this includes the metrics that really are a good, uh, serve to provide a good understanding of the, of the entire population. So we have a biodiversity indicator that looks at how many different species are present and how unique they are in their uh, taxonomy. So the you know the more species there are and the more diverse they are, the higher your biodiversity score will be. We have a functionality score that doesn't just look at species, but rather looks at the functions that those species play and how many total beneficial plant growth promoting functions they perform. We have a resilience indicator we also look at under soil quality, which relates to the ability of the microbes to deal with stress and disturbance. Higher resilient soils, microbes that score higher in terms of resilience are uh, less susceptible to the stress and disturbance posed by both biotic and abiotic stressors that we know can uh, have, have a negative impact on microbes like tillage, drought, uh, fungicide, and fumigants. Um, and we also have fungi to bacteria ratio and mycorrhizal ratio as informative indicators that give an idea of the breakdown of how that population looks overall and the, the balance between the two main types of mycorrhizal fungi, which we know are um, both beneficial plant growth promoting fungi. Um, the plant health and nutrient cycling sections really get more into specifics in terms of agronomic outcomes. So while the soil quality category is uh, very, very powerful information, it's really looking at kind of the big picture from the top down, looking at the whole population. But when it comes to specific plant health and nutrient cycling functions, these are these second and third category, really, we're getting down to those individual functional groups of microbes that, that are ultimately going to play those roles that can, can promote disease resilience, promote you know, uh, efficient nutrient cycling and nutrient use efficiency and reduce the need for fertilizers. Uh, the plant health category encompasses soil-borne diseases, so we detect any major pathogens listed under 
the crop type of focus and, and provide a risk level from uh, low to high. We also look at natural biocontrol agents. So the microbes that are uh, packaged in like biofungicide products or bioinsecticides are the species that we look in in that group, natural biocontrol agents. So we can give an idea of the natural ability of the soil to suppress diseases. And then we also look at two interesting and I'd say underrated groups are the phytohormone producers and uh, stress adaptation metabolite producers. These are microbes that produce compounds like auxin, cytokinin, ACC deaminase, um, which we all commonly refer to as PGRs or plant growth regulators. So uh, here we're measuring not the PGRs themselves, but the levels of the microbes that actually produce these compounds, which are, are known to help promote plant growth and also uh, promote stress tolerance. Um, and then lastly, nutrient cycling is pretty self-explanatory. This is where we categorize microbes according uh, to the roles and their, the abundance uh, of them that play into nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium cycling, carbon cycling, a big one that we look at along with the, our major uh, plant-related macros. Included in the carbon pathways is an organic matter breakdown index, as well as carbon fixation. And then we look at most of the, uh, uh, most of the meaningful micronutrient pathways as well, the uh, levels of microbes that can cycle and unlock uh, micronutrients like uh, zinc and calcium. And then another one last tidbit to mention in terms of details provided on the bee crop report. We also offer a service referred to as bee crop plus where we can tack on uh, chemical fertility testing through some of our partnership labs that we have established relationships with. The options include the Haney soil test, uh, Malik one or three or standard full panel. Uh, Malik that is that's commonly available at major commercial ag labs and also total soil digestion or total nutrient digestion another uh, service we offer that can that this offers the ability to really tack on not just look at your soil biology but also look at it side by side with the chemical fertility and some physical soil data to provide uh, uh, the broader picture in terms of soil health because of course at biomakers we know the biology is, is of course a big focus of our our technology um, and, and you know the avenues that we look down, but we also know that you can't lose sight of the chemical fertility um, and physical aspects of soil, which in turn do influence the biology as the biology in turn influences physiochemical traits. So um, yeah, just a quick rundown for those who aren't familiar with our bee crop tests or haven't seen um, reports before. And one other you know aspect that uh, we kind of hit on in the soil quality section, but uh, another. Um, recent update to our reports is that we, we recently added a cover page. Um, so this was added um, several months back and, and folks who sent in samples maybe in 2023 or 2022 or prior may not have seen this, but uh, this new highlight page looks at the three, uh, it, it uh, chooses three metrics for improvement and highlights those sort of the low hanging fruit or the biological metrics that, uh, that, deficient, that are most likely to, to present deficiencies or bottlenecks to yield and uh, soil health. So basically, this this first page prioritizes any any areas of focus. So that out of the th we have about 35, 36 indicators across those three categories that I mentioned on the previous slide. And this first page, instead of a grower or agronomist having to page through the whole report, they can look at this to give a quick diagnosis and rundown on you know what biological pathways or functions um, most likely are restricting their yield or limiting their soil health. Um, and then this first page, in addition to the three areas of, of focus for improvement, we also have the soil biosustainability score, which is really the closest thing we have to an overall score on our report. It is part of our soil quality section, so it's one of those sort of overarching um, indicators. And we like to refer to it as a functional soil biodiversity score because it takes into account the species present and their functions. And it's also based on microbial ecology. So based on how these, meaning how the microbes interact, not just with the crop, whether you know, which is their functions, but also how the microbes interact with each other. If you have a more symbiotic microbiome, you know, microbes don't exist in isolation. They can interact and either cooperate or antagonize each other. And this soil biosustainability score tends to score higher when microbes are more cooperative and symbiotic, more positive interaction between them, it tends to score lower when microbes are more antagonistic and maybe overly competitive. And we tend to see that, you know, we've, we've actually benchmarked this soil biosustainability sustainability score to different management programs where, where a higher score is typical of a more regenerative microbiome um, with, you know, practices like cover crops and no-till. Lower scores are typically associated with more intensively managed fields with 
higher degrees of tillage, maybe more fumigants and fungicides, more high salt index fertilizers, and a more disturbed soil microbiome as a result of those stressors. And the way that my ecology is kind of a complex concept, but the way I often like to explain this is, you know, just like any, aside from microbes, even humans and other animals, when we're really stressed out and the way that microbes might be stressed out by excessive tillage or excessive chemical, you know, high salt index fertilizers, when we're really stressed out, we may have more trouble being as cooperative, getting along, you know, existing as part of a community. And we may be more in like survival mode. That's how when microbes are under a lot of stress, they kind of go into fight or flight mode. And, you know, when we're in a life or death situation or in fight or flight mode, we're often thinking about, you know, how we're going to get by not so much, you know, doing our day-to-day -day responsibilities and supporting, you know, the, the people next to us. So in the, in the way soil, a soil com uh, microbial community is very similar and with, a higher soil biosustainability score, typically we're seeing more, more positive interactions, microbes that are complementing each other's functions rather than uh, competing and antagonizing each other and going into survival mode. So I wanted to spend a little time discussing that because when we look at uh, Steve's results, there were some really interesting uh, comparisons here on the biosustainability score. Um, so to get into the, the project that we looked at um, with Steve, which was a very interesting comparison and a strong case study. Often, we, we like a lot of soil uh, analytical tools, we always uh, focus on comparisons because that's typically where the strongest insights are going to come out of, you know, rather than just looking at a shot in the dark or you can, you know, use one or several samples as a benchmark. But in this case, we had a very strong comparison that uh, Steve helped us design as far as this project goes. So location was at uh, in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on Steve's farm as well as a neighboring farm. The samples were taken in season during the hemp season, in August, so a nice warm time of year. Typically when, you know, the, as the microbiome warms up during the growing season, it's a great time to get uh, checkpoint samples to see how a regenerative program or biological program is really performing um, in season. And uh, the samples are uh, taken and then four to six weeks later, the reports and analysis uh, are released. So the design and goals here, uh, what we were looking at, uh, Steve mentioned an interest in demonstrating the impact of cover cropping, no-till, and uh, IMOs or indigenous microorganism solutions, which I wanna uh, touch on in a minute, uh, which is essentially an inoculant product, and compare it to Steve's neighbor who is going through a transitional process of piloting, um, piloting uh, hemp production uh, very close by, if I'm not mistaken, Steve. They're like across the street, or you know, a few a few blocks down, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. uh, what we did was we had both Steve pulled three samples in his field. Three samples in one field is typically enough for a nice strong uh, representative average, so that we can see how much variability there is. And then he took three samples in his neighbor's transitional pilot hemp field for comparison. Um, and with the deliverables, we have uh, six B crop results, you know, three reports for uh, Steve's regenerative hemp field and three for the neighbors, um, focusing on all of those metrics that we just covered, um, as well as access to our digital platform, which we'll, um, we'll use, we'll look at in a minute to visualize some of the data. And then also something we offer to anyone is the ability to take our, so our free soil health training course, the B crop advisor program, um, which it gives, it's designed from a very layman approach to give a, uh, overview of not only biomakers and bee crop technology, but applications of our, of our soil biology data and general soil uh, health foundational concepts. So it's, a, it's, a rel it's about a two to three hour course with some uh, a quiz and uh, exam at the end and provides access to some other resources too. So uh, another deliverable that we wanted to mention there. So now to get into the fun part, some of the results. And I do wanna mention that across these tests, there was a lot of data to go through. We are definitely not uh, going to go through all of it for the sake of time today. I want to take some time at, uh, to talk through and, uh, some discussion points with Steve on cover crops and some of the foundations of his uh, soil health focused management programs that he's developed over the last several decades. But the, these uh, next few slides will really hit on kind of the highlights, the really interesting areas of, of uh, the interesting data points that really showed uh, big differences between Steve's field and his neighbors and some of the areas where his neighbor's field was already uh, showing some strong soil biological function. So this is that soil, these are the soil quality indicators that we mentioned. Again, these are really looking at the full microbiome and they're scored on a zero to hundred scale. So we 
On our bee crop test reports, they're designed to read very similarly to a standard chemical fertility report with the optimal or low, medium, high uh, rankings. Those low, medium, high rankings are based on our database of, of tens of thousands of soil uh, biology samples and are, are uh, generated on a crop specific basis for crops that we have enough data on. So a score of 76 out of 100 is in the, you know, that's in the top 25 percentile of very, that's, you know, the top quarter of our database and generally a very strong score. Um, as we get from 60 to above, which is the high range of our database, that's where we tend to see the farmers, you know, the farms land that have been uh, long-term no-till, integrating cover crops for some time, using biologicals instead of, um, you know, instead of harsh uh, crop protection products like fungicides or fumigants. So that was one thing that stood out immediately was Steve's uh, uh, field scored really high when it came to our, that soil biosustainability score. So again, that's, that's really the closest thing we have to an overall score and that high, that high range is indicating a lot of cooperation and synergy between these microbes. So more, more of a, uh, a functional community, not just, not just really beneficial microbes on their own, but also as a community and how they interact. And then biodiversity was very high. So a lot of different species present in the soil and a wide range of different types of species. Functionality scored very high as well. So functionality doesn't really take into account how these microbes interact, but just what they, what beneficial plant growth promoting functions they perform on their own. And that, of course, that was very high as well. So again, great to see that, you know, the microbes are working great as a community. Also, func also very highly functional as far as what they're contributing as individuals. And then resilience is in the medium range. And what's interesting with resilience is anecdotally, we've noticed in long-term regenerative fields like Steve's, resilience is the one indicator that often shows a little bit of a contrary trend to these other three, biosustainability, biodiversity, and functionality. And sort of the hypothesis or theory behind that is that when we look at resilience, we're looking at microbes' ability to deal with stress and disturbance. And in a no-till scenario and cover crops where there's living roots most, you know, much of the year, those, those uh, microbes are, are given a very favorable environment. You know, there's not, they have, a, they have roots there, they have root exudates from the crop, they're not being tilled and agitated constantly in a no-till scenario um, like Steve tends to practice. So what we, what we theorize is that resilience may go down when you're not introducing as much stress and disturbance into the soil. Um, obviously, you know, resilience is good to have, but we've seen some fields that are very intensive tillage, you know, high, high use of, of chemical fertility and high salt index fertilizers. And then sometimes resilience is high while functionality, biodiversity, biosustainability are low. And in that case, you know, it, all that tillage and stress what we theorized is that it's eliminating the microbes that are less resilient and selecting for the more resilient ones. Whereas in this case, the amount of the cover crops and no-till, the, the factors that are minimizing disturbance may actually be um, selecting for more microbes that are not quite as resilient, which is, you know, kind of, it, generally you want an environment where you can maintain some of those microbes that may not be as resilient because they may offer very important functions. But that was just interesting that that sort of emerged here. And even in the medium range, that's generally optimal. What we, we like to see resilience from medium to high. So that's that's good. Um, and Steve, I wanted to give you a chance to chime in here a little bit on the IMOs, the indigenous microorganism solution, because that, as we were discussing earlier, that's a concept that we is, is getting to be a fairly hot topic. There's some, I think, ambiguity and, and different definitions out there, but just wanted to give you a, a chance to give a rundown on what your IMO's development sort of looks like and, and uh, how that carries over to, to you know, soil inputs. Hey, thanks, Gus, uh, and also to Neil for helping their ranges. So, you know, IMO's is something that uh, caught my attention here a couple years ago, and I gotta give credit to Deanna and Kelly Lozenski from uh, the Dakotas. They have really kind of taken this and, uh, <clears throat> and, and, you know, helped me get, get interested in it. I took Elaine Ingram's course like 20 years ago or whenever, um, and I was fascinated by compost teas, you know, Johnson Sioux, all these good type of things that are starting to become more and more popular. Uh, for me personally, it just seemed like um, I didn't have time <laughs> to do all the work that needed to do this. I certainly support the concept. And, you know, IMOS is in farmer's terms is, is basically you're taking you know, indigenous means something that's living locally or on your farm. So you're taking active microbes that are on your farm 
that have essentially been undisturbed uh, for your know, decades. Uh, you look for places where the grass is particularly is growing green and vibrant, like where are they getting that nitrogen? If, and I didn't apply any nitrogen to that part. Well, there must be nitrogen producing organisms in there. And again, I'm speaking very simplistic here. So we take <clears throat> good undisturbed soil from around the farm, and there's a method to all this, and basically feed it for a while and, and then uh, extract it out there like a, like a, like a tea. And, and then we take that, we, we multiply those, those organisms, and then we apply them back to our fields, which they probably were 100 years ago anyway. Uh, so the idea is, is to put these microorganisms back into our fields, or I like the way Deanna and Kelly say, you borrow them from one part of the farm and re-inoculate them into your main cash crop growing areas. And it takes a couple of years to build their population, but I did this on this hemp field that we're talking about, also in my heirloom tomatoes, uh, where I did this, and I'm convinced it's working. I mean, I didn't do like wide, wide scale replicated treatments, but you know, I'm not applying as much fertilizer. And uh, so I just think this is the, the most simplest, simplistic way I know of where we as farmers can kind of take back our own, I'm going to say it, fertility. It's there, it's right under our feet. And, you know, Gus is, is I just had to think, you know, you're opening up a whole new world to us uh, in this. And I've heard a saying that we know more about the galaxies than we do the soil six inches under our feet. And I think that's the point of this whole uh, webinar today. That's six inches under our feet. We know there's different tools being developed, all different kinds of soil health tools. But the more I learn, the more I realize what I don't know. And uh, so this, that's what I appreciate about with what the biome makers are doing is that you're unpacking, you're discovering the whole biological world that we pretty much ignored for the last 80 years, we'll just say. And now we're realizing that our management practices do affect it. And uh, it seems like this IMOS is something that needs some uh, continued effort to better understand it. I know we're continuing to better understand it ourselves. So that's what intrigued me. I'm seeing early results, and I say early results, two years, uh, that look promising. So that's kind of what got me intrigued with it. And uh, we're gonna definitely continue to, to, to work at it throughout the year. I would mention one thing, the best way to get it into the soil is to put it on your seeds. Like when you plant and get it in the ground, like especially cover crops, because cover crops you're planting anywhere from, you know, 500,000 to a million seeds per acre, depending on rates. So you're able to put this on the seeds and that's a way to, that's the vehicle to get it in the ground. Uh, so you wanna get it in the ground and, and I won't go into more details, but I wanna mention that quickly. Thanks, Steve. Really valuable insights there. That was actually one kind of curiosity I had is how you're actually applying this IMO solution when in, in the field. And one of the things that gets talked about a lot with biological inoculants is whether they're native or whether they would clash with the native microbiome. And my understanding with IMOs is because you're taking those microbes from nearby or on the farm and, you know, in areas that are growing vigorously, you're really culturing those native microbes that hopefully ideally are, are already suitable to your niche you know to your climate region your soil type and you know that's made and also get microbes that hopefully get along with the, you know the populations that are already there in your soil but may be a little bit more degraded or may not be at the levels that they uh, need to be to, to support productivity of the crop without you know much fertility but the the high soil biosustainability and also the high biodiversity scores on your report would give uh, some give some hint that this is you know having a favorable effect as well as the rest of, of your program of course the cover crops and long-term no-till so yeah really appreciate you elaborating there and you kind of answered some of the questions I had on the back end about IMOS too um, keep uh, going through to the comparison here so this again is Steve's uh, the results of one of Steve's tests from his regenerative hemp field and now we're going to jump over to his neighbor's field which was you know it, it, there were, we talked a little bit about the management practices your neighbor's been doing and they're trying, you know, it sounds like they're in the process of sort of transitioning to more cover crops and more regenerative practices, but historically they have applied poultry manure. And I think that helps explain why we did see some, especially in the nutrient cycling section, saw some decent numbers on their report. And they've been doing occasional cover crop, but also occasional tillage. So not quite down the path that, you know, Steve's been down for, for quite a few decades of uh, significant investment in soil health and regenerative ag. So 
looking at their biosustainability score, we see it was about half at a, a 34, which is really interesting because again, that's you know lo really looking at the microbial ecology and especially factors like tillage. They they because we benchmarked this biosustainability score against practices, it would make sense that some tillage would be a driving factor that might that might lead to a lower biosustainability score. But the good news, of course, for your neighbor is biodiversity was very high. It's great to see. Maybe on account of the poultry manure and some of the other you know occasional cover crops and other beneficial soil health practices they're doing. And functionality is is high. So that's it's you know in the second highest category. Good to see. And resilience was very low, interestingly. So that's maybe one area for potential improvement and shows that their soil may actually be more susceptible to disturbance from tillage or fertilizers and such. But overall, there was some good here, but it was funny because I remember, Steve, when we got these results, yeah, they were labeled by the field name, which is typical, but it didn't say regenerative, transitional. I didn't actually know which was which. And I looked at, glanced at these biosustainability and, and uh, soil quality scores and pretty instantly assumed that this one was yours. And I'm, I'm glad that the data uh, proved right. But um, yeah, it's interesting. There's, you know, your neighbor's fields definitely doesn't look like a lot of the long-term heavy disc tillage fields that we see that are fallow, you know, half the year that are doing no cover cropping. So there's, they've got a lot to work with, but also of course, you know, room, some room for improvement. Um, and then going in, I wanted, I, again, we're not, for the sake of time, not gonna go into all the results, but wanted to touch on the nutrient cycling section. So these are Steve's results for carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, each divided up by uh, these rows. And, you know, with nut nutrient cycling, when we look at the biology, it's a lot more complex than just a simple chemical fertility test extraction where you have one, usually one value related to available phosphorus, one value for potassium, maybe some reports have nitrate and ammonia, you know, two different forms of nitrogen, but usually, you know, they're running a chemical extraction, giving you one number representing the quantity or plant availability of that nutrient. With biology, it's very complex because microbes don't just play one role and there's not just one or two species or groups of microbes to measure. We have a range of, of many different groups and many different functions that we have to look at, including microbes that supply nutrients uh, and microbes that also compete for nutrients or play indirect benefits in cycling these nutrients. Um, so with it, we have a, a report that goes beyond just, just one index and gives you a little bit more nuance, but we can see on Steve's results a lot of blue here, a lot of results in very, the very high ranges, which we like to see most of these metrics medium to high. And then micronutrients on the right, uh, all of these, these five scored very well here, iron, copper, calcium, manganese, and sulfur. When we hop over to your neighbor's results, they were pretty good overall. You notice carbon, carbon fixation was still high, but their nitrogen cycle, uh, so this indirect benefit as far as nitrogen cycle goes, this is looking at the microbes that help keep, essentially keep nitrogen in the soil and uh, maintain a, a, a consistent metabolism of, of converting nitrogen to plant available forms without causing too much volatilization or leaching. So these are kind of the, the microbes involved in the intermediate steps of, of uh, ni the nitrogen cycle, like your denitrifiers and nitrifiers. And oops, and if we go back to Steve's results, we can see those were in the very high range. So um, that's one area for improvement. There also, also was lower potassium solubilization in your neighbor's field, but overall, uh, the, the nutrient supply sections are all in the medium to high range. So again, they're, they're, they're looking like a pretty solid starting point, like maybe that poultry manure has pushed their soil biology in a pretty good direction, but they still have some areas where they are lagging a little bit behind your long-term regenerative fields. Um, and, and micronutrients especially, we see copper, calcium, and manganese quite a bit lower than, than uh, on your test. So, and, and I mean, there's a lot of similarities in these tests, I think just because they're right down the street, you know, similar climate, similar region, similar soil type, but this is a pretty good comparison that get te is testifies to how cover crops and regenerative hemp practices can lead to positive outcomes, and as well as the IMOs and the other practices that you're conducting on these fields. Um, I want to make sure we have plenty of time at the end for questions, both audience questions and a few good discussion points that we have uh, for Steve, but one last area we wanted to touch on and also share some more of uh, Steve's soil biology data is through our, our bee crop portal tools. So our online portal is free to use for any uh, clients and includes tools that allow you to access your soil data, uh, both your, your PDF reports 
and also some tools that allow us to dive into the microbial species present in samples and run some comparisons between samples uh, in terms of the functionality metrics um, scored in the, the uh, reports in a little bit more uh, detail here in, in the portal. So uh, one area we wanted to see in on is, the, is those nitrogen and other NPK cycling indexes. So here we have some examples of the, the data that's, that's gleaned from, uh, from our portal. We have here the, that nitrogen cycle index that was, was higher in Steve, and, and the transitional is Steve's neighbor's field, the regenerative again is Steve's hemp field. We can see that there was an average, if I, I'm going to zoom in a little just to make it a little easier. So the nitrogen cycle index again looks at the microbes that are involved in converting nitrogen between the intermediate forms and mitigating or causing loss of nitrogen. So a higher nitrogen cycle index means you have a stronger pathway for nitrogen you know to go consistently and at a at a steady pace from the organic from the ammonia to nitrite to nitrate into plant of you know the plant available forms of ammonia and nitrate and and ideally a higher score would indicate that you're getting less loss of nitrogen through volatilization so your neighbors scored pretty good at a 63 average each of these little triangles and dots is one of the three the results for one of the three samples, but we have pretty tight uh, variability here. There's so there's an eight BCS just stands for B crop score. If I go up here, that's that's just a zero to 100 index that represents our very low to very high range. So a sample scoring very high is in the 80 to 100th percentile. A sample scoring very low is in the zero to 20th. Um, but we can see your neighbor's transitional field was pretty solid at a 63, but it was almost a 20. Uh, percentile increase of B crop score as far as the regenerative fields. Um, so nitrogen cycle was one of the biggest differences we saw in the NPK pathways. But here on the right, this box also shows some of the other metrics. We can see potassium solubilization, phosphorus solubilization, um, some other phosphorus and nitrogen metrics were in the range of six to 10 percentile points higher on average, you know, across the three samples. So this is a pretty strong testament to the you know fact that you're practices are moving the needle, at least compared to your neighbors. And your neighbors, you know, generally speaking against our database is scoring pretty well. So hopefully their poultry manure and their other practices are doing good, but hopefully as they're interested in hemp and maybe, you know, integrating more cover crop, maybe they'll uh, start to really get the needle moving a little bit closer to where your soil biology uh, nutrient cycling is at. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on, I mentioned that our B-Crop portal has some tools to look at species, not just microbial functions, but some of the actual species and genus or groups of bacteria and fungi uh, behind our, our reports. Um, our reports themselves don't include the, every single species listed because that would just be probably data overload for most folks. And even, even folks like me who work on the regenerative ag side as uh, soil health focused agronomists. There's not a lot of data we can glean from a long list of scientific names, but uh, there are certain groups that may be of interest, particularly pathogens and then some of the well-known plant growth promoting groups of, of bacteria and fungi. And here we have a comparison of the abundance of certain uh, bacterial and fungal groups in the, again, Steve's neighbor's transitional field and then his regenerative field. And on the top, what we're looking at is the abundance of bacillus. Bacillus are really heavily studied and well-known group of common beneficial bacteria. And we can see that on total, there is an average abundance out of all the bacteria. So this, on the uh, horizontal axis, we have the relative abundance of, of bacillus out of all the bacteria detected. You can see in the transitional field, they made up on average about 3% of, of all the species. And it was a really consistent value there across all three of their samples. Whereas in Steve's regenerative field, it was double at an average of 6.5%. One sample was all the way up to a 7.5%. And bacillus are known to perform a lot of beneficial functions, including nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium cycling. A lot of There's a lot of products out there that sell bacillus and packaged up as uh, phosphorus and potassium solubilizers. So this may be part of the reason we saw um, a little bit higher phosphorus and potassium cycling in your fields. And then we can also look at pathogens. So fusarium, you know, there's fusarium are very common. We see them in almost every sample. And they're not all pathogenic, but a lot of the major fusarium, like fusarium oxysporum, are regarded as pathogens and, and looked at as species of concern. And we can see in the transitional field, the average fusarium was about 2.89, a pretty wide range. But the average in the regenerative field is only 1.36, which is, you know, fairly low. So that's interesting that we kind of, you know, 
we don't always see group is cut and dry patterns between samples and you know in the taxonomy of, spe of certain species or groups of microbes but these were pretty interesting trends and patterns to point out and if we look we also have a tool that looks at the entire microbiome where we can highlight um, specific species or groups and in the orange you know each of these little uh, gray circles or all of these circles in general represent a species or genus and the size of the circle is proportional to the abundance of those microbes in the in the sample and in this this top box we have a transitional sample and the orange uh, circles represent all the bacillus out of the species and then on the bottom we have the regenerative and you can see there's a lot more bacillus there and some of these bigger circles are bacillus that are you can see that the circles are bigger so those bacillus are more abundant um, in the regenerative field and then fusarium kind of the opposite pattern where the regenerative field we see a, the blue dots represent the fusarium and there's fewer in the regenerative and bigger dots and more of them uh, over in the transitional so if there are you know that's one area i think of interest with with imos there may be the ability you know with you know replicated before and after sampling to see what species is that IMOs called, you know, what is it is really promoting and what species may it be inoculating really effectively. But of course, there's probably hundreds to thousands of species in the IMOs. So that's a, it's a lot to piece together, but definitely something that we're starting to look into and working on with some projects uh, at Biomakers. So with that, uh, wow, we ran, I was trying to go quick, but of course there's a lot of data to get through. So wanna make sure we have about 20 minutes left for discussion points and also wanna take some audience questions for sure. And I think the big focus here, you know, talking about cover crops and hemp, there's a lot of points to take this. But Steve, one thing that we get asked about a lot that I, I really wanted to ask you about, especially this is especially a question we get from growers who really want to lean into using cover crops, but they're not, they're not, they're they're a little bit risk averse or a little bit concerned about some of the potential drawbacks. And often, you know, cereal rye gets thrown around as one of the, you know, probably the cover crop that is on the most acres in the U.S. as far as cover crops go and cereal rye or winter rye often regarded as a good starter cover crop. Um, but there's also some skepticism and concern we hear about the cereal rye uh, so, you know, sucking up too much nutrients ahead of uh, crops like hemp or tomatoes or corn that require a lot of fertility. And also a lift some concern, cereal rye of course can be great as a, as a weed suppressive crop, but also it has uh, you know, some allelopathic effects. So I wanted to get your thoughts on maybe best practices with cereal rye and where it works and where it doesn't and um, kind of what your experience has been. I think that's something a lot of our listeners will be in, uh, intrigued to hear more about. You're correct, cereal rye is the most popular because it's so, um, it's so you know, flexible. It can be planted almost any time of the year uh, and it will grow. So, uh, but it has a few, points of management that you need to understand. Uh, and the way it uh, interacts with nutrient uptake is, an, <clears throat> is important that farmers understand. And this is what makes it such a great crop. It can take up nitrogen very well in the spring. And if you go to plant a nitrogen loving crop like corn, it will essentially empty the soil profile of nitrate nitrogen, which is a wonderful thing because we don't want that to escape. We don't want to lose it. But so, so corn can, <clears throat> compared to what people used to their fertility programs and everything with cover crop is kind of like backed up against what people have done for decades. And, and you have to change your management. And this, this, this comes with almost, you know, any cover crop species that's out there. So the, 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 the thing that makes rye, cereal rye so good also has a backside of heavy management. And so if you're planting corn, uh, and again, all this is also, uh, be, be determined by what is your history, uh, how how far into regenerative agriculture are you? Uh, so uh, I like to use the term the rules of the game change the longer it's being played. So I give this all as a backdrop drop because let's take corn for example. You're going to need to put more nitrogen up front. Any additional nitrogen you're going to need up front. When I say you're going to put that almost that planting. Whereas, on conversely, with hairy vetch, it's the opposite. Hairy vetch produces nitrogen. You probably don't need to put any nitrogen on the corn uh, until later, or if at all, depending on the stage of the hairy vetch and the stage of your, you know, your soil quality. So, uh, but I do want to mention alleliopathy. Alleliopathy is this kind of uh, thing you need to be aware of in cereal rye that has a natural, we'll call it a chemical, that once it's decomposing, it leaches that into the soil. 
and it can actually hurt the germination of small seeded broadleaves, which is great for um, for uh, weeds, like a lot of our weeds, pigweed, um, lamb's quarter. Those things are small seeded broadleaves. That's great. I will say quickly that soybeans flourish after cereal rye. Now they're a broadleaf, but they're a large seed. So that's where you can see that that's that's you know again understanding the the background. Now part of our topic today is hemp. Well, what is hemp? Is it a large seeded broadleaf or a small seeded? It's kind of in the middle. I have done I've kind of came on this by almost accident where I had cereal rye as a cover crop planted the fall before and black oats, which is winter oats, planted the year before. And I had a field that I planted uh, industrial hemp in, in this case, and to the line where I had cereal rye, the hemp was more lethargic, it wasn't as even, and it baffled me. And uh, I was talking to someone on the phone, and they said, well, Steve, you're the cover crop coach, you should know this. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, well, cereal rye has an allelopathic against small broadleaf. I'm like, duh. You know, I didn't think of that, and I'm pretty convinced that that is the case. So we don't want to plant cereal rye before hemp. Uh, and so, and again, this is just a practical management method that you need to understand uh, with cereal rye in the context of uh, planting your, your cash crops. Great information, really valuable insights there. And I think really you hit on a lot of the questions we get about adoption of cereal rye and, and other cover crops and how the you know, approaches to practice changes need to be uh, considered. Really good answer. Um, what I have a, a bunch of other questions, but I'm going to kind of prioritize ones that I think are most intriguing and related to our topic today. One I'm really excited to ask about is is selective breeding and and you know culturing certain varieties of cover crop to select for certain traits because in cat you know there's so much investment in the traits and genetics of cash crops like corn and even you know specialty crops as well. And we, you know, seed suppliers know their traits super well. But I know, Steve, that you've done some work on cover crops, and cover crops are, at the end of the day, they're, they're crops just like cash crops. But we don't talk a lot about their genetics and their traits. So I'd love to hear a bit about your experience with selecting for certain varieties, how that's gone, and maybe what you kind of see in, in as far as uh, selective breeding, maybe holding in the future for cover crops. Yeah, um, it's something I've been interested in for over 20 years, and I work with the tillage radish. I developed the tillage radish, and also most people aren't aware of that I do have a, a hairy vetch variety. Like over my shoulder here, you see in the wall is my USDA uh, PVP plant variety protection uh, for a hairy, a hairy vetch variety that I have. And and I I, I went into that not intentionally, uh, but when I realized I actually was selecting. Uh, for some traits that were desirable, I thought, wow, let's do this. And so it was really the Tilly's Radish where I learned uh, about how this process works. And uh, I mean, if you're going to actually take a variety to market, it is a standard thing to do. And if anybody's interested in that, you're going to have to read up on it and talk to people who know how to do it. But to your point, uh, Gus, what is what we started out in the cover crop industry as it started to come to life uh, 25 years ago, I'll say, is we were using like off the shelf uh, species that were out there. Some of them are pretty good, but winter hardiness, or the ability to last through the winter, planting later in the fall, all those things have been really big challenges with cover crops. So there are plant breeders now that are actually focusing on developing cover crops for traits that are beneficial. And uh, it's not quite as lucrative as cash crops because cash crops, like it or not, are heavily subsidized. Uh, and I'm just going to say it. <laughs> I have a little bit of a, a, a thing there with all this, but uh, but but with cover crops, it's kind of like on the on the own the dime of whoever's whoever's doing. It. I mean, people don't realize that it costs you know up to fifty thousand dollars. I had fifty thousand dollars in the belt in tillage radish, and then when people take your seed and they start growing it themselves, it's like ah, eh, don't appreciate that. Uh, you really can't do that. Uh, but you know, so I'm just there's a lot of things here go into this. Uh, but and it's going to continue. I'm really excited about now, even though I'm out of the cover crop business myself, I'm excited to see companies that are investing and in selecting uh, for enhanced cover crop species. And that's just going to help the whole industry. Awesome. Yeah, really exciting to be at the forefront of that. And it's, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of room to go, you know, as far as cover crop breeding and development, but it's exciting to start to see more seed suppliers 
thinking kind of of their cover crops like a cash crop as far as the you know traits they offer and factors like you mentioned like winter you know uh, winter hardiness and such are going to vary a lot from region to region so some of those traits are going to be the probably make or break difference between an effective cover crop contribution versus potentially uh mm -hmm. you know some bad experiences or yield drag so so yeah really it, really interesting insights there the last question i want to ask before we we have some great audience questions coming in that I want to make sure we, we get to some of them, but um, this is one that we get asked a lot. And I think this is, I, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, Steve, but I know it's top of mind also for a lot of our clients and a lot of growers who are looking to lean towards cover crops. What, what specific cover crop types or mixes have sort of become your go-to, particularly with the roller crimper for effective termination and, and positive soil health outcomes? So, uh, you know, before I like answer that question, everybody has to develop their own, I'm going to say cocktail or cover crop mixes. And it really comes down to what are you trying to accomplish as a farmer? Uh, so I'm going to use an example for me. I grow quite a bit of uh, pumpkins and we plant them later. Uh, we start planting the last of uh, part of May. We'll be starting that pretty soon. And <clears throat> so I don't need a cereal rye for that. Um, Cereal rye uh, really matures in my area here in southeastern Pennsylvania. I mean, it's in heads right now uh, in the second week of May. And uh, so it, ma it doesn't, it matches, it's a little too early to like my hairy vetch. So I like to use triticale or more recently, I've been using more black oats, which is a winter oat with a hairy vetch or with a crimson clover. So um, I must say that, you know, the hairy vetch is a special place for me because I developed a variety, it's called winter king. And it's developed to be able to plant later in the fall and survive the winter. Specifically in, this, in the mid-Atlantic region, we have more freeze thaw cycles than most areas of the country. And so but the ability of a plant to survive the winter is not as much sometimes how cold it gets in your area. It's how much it does the freeze thaw cycles because the, the ground heaves when it freezes, thaws, freeze thaws, and it can rip the little roots apart. So when we build up uh, varieties that are able to withstand that, that's what makes them valuable. So, so hairy batch is a part of what I do. Uh, the black oats, because it's later maturing. But if you're going, if you're a cash grain farmer, you want that cereal rye. It's the first one to start growing in the spring and, and to get uh, get uh, results. So, so th this is why I'm answering the question to myself, but also to everybody else. What are you trying to accomplish? And this is why cereal rye is so popular because it can be planted late and then it can, it's the first thing to grow in the spring. So you can get more out of it quicker than almost any out there. But if you have other planting windows that you're working with, there's other options out there. So, so that's some of the things you want to think about uh, in, in your own situation. What are you trying to accomplish? And then you, you go off that. I love that answer. Yeah, more of a systems focused approach, not so much a hard prescription, but you need to consider the context and geography and goals, I would say being, yeah, I love that you hit on that because that's often what we talk about when we're going over bee crop reports is you know how we're going to interpret them and what highlights we're going to hit on as far as recommendations often don't just depend on the data but the goals and context of the grower or agronomist or crop consultant um i have probably a million other questions i want to ask you but for the sake of time i want to jump into some audience questions we got some really good ones related both to bee crop and for you steve and your experience particularly with this um, hemp trial one thing we got asked on the bee crop side is how is microbial stress measured? And I want to clarify with that question on microbial stress. We don't measure microbial stress itself. We're not stressing out microbes and measuring their response, although that is something that can be done with our testing to look in maybe a water stressed environment, how the microbiome changes from a normal moisture environment. But what we do look at when I was talking about stress, I was referring to that resilience indicator we saw, which measured pretty well in Steve's field and uh, in the medium range. And what we're looking at there is really when we're measuring, we're measuring the ability of the microbes to deal with stress. And that is the best way I like to explain it is we're looking at their versatility and ad adaptability. Um, and that's, you know, microbes that are more adaptable to different niches of environments, different temperatures, different, you know, metabolites, different nutrients that they can use. They're more able to deal with maybe big differences in swings and temperature or rainfall or even like tillage. So while we don't measure the direct effects of stress in our reports, we, we do measure the, the microbes ability to deal with that stress. 
Um, we also got asked our biodiversity functionality and resilience weighted equally in the soil biosustainability score. And we get, that's often a common assumption. That's actually what I assumed when I was first joining biomakers and looking at those four metrics. But in fact, the biosustainability score is independent of the other three. It's, and the reason, one of the reasons for that, while it is a functional biodiversity score, we like to refer to it as, it also accounts for the microbes interactions with each other. So that's kind of an additional element, that microbial ecology piece. So it's all four of those metrics are actually independent. It's not a weighted uh, calculation as far as biosustainability. Um, let's see, a question that we got received that I'm also kind of curious about, um, we often talk about like indicator species, and of course in microbes, that's that's why I looked at bacillus that we saw at higher abundance in your field, because they're kind of a good, well-known indicator species. But the, of course, we're looking at soil DNA. There's also macros, you know, mac what you might refer to as like uh, macro organisms that are like your earthworms and those that you can see with your naked eye. And someone asked Steve, what is what does your earthworm population look like on your farm? Uh, well, the, my, my record uh, that I've seen is 36 earthworms that I've seen out uh, in a square yard as, as in an evening. That's what I physically saw. I took a picture of it to show it. Um, so I've never really done like a square foot measurement, but, you know, uh, and, and, and that's a lot. That's a, a lot of time that's really relative according to the time of year. And it gets dry. You know, you don't see them very often. It's, it's good in the spring. This time of year, they're up there eating a lot. You'll see them everywhere. Uh, but you know, I, I and, and I can tell you this: I have some fields that are better than others. Um, so you know, pretty much every every small shovel pool, you'll see several several earthworms uh, in it. And I know that's not a specific answer, but earthworms are clearly probably one of the best indicators that you're at least on the right track. And I'll quickly say too how quickly residue is decomposed. That's not just with earthworms, there's other things there. But just being a student of that, observing how fast your residue is decomposed is uh, another indicator. And smell. I habitually, I do this so much, I habitually, I'll, I'll, when, I, when I dig in the soil, I'm, I'm smelling it. Uh, and, and that's like, I, I liken it to if anybody's into you know, wine and so forth, you, know, you kind of have that thing, you swirl around, you smell, it's just like a habit you get into uh, because there's different smells, and I've been around the world, and I've smelled some soils that are really, really bad. Uh, they just almost pungent, almost, almost smell like sewage. Uh, and then I've smelled some soils like I like to tell people, if you know you have a good soil, it's like you want to take a second sniff, and uh, that's a good soil, and it's just a pleasant aroma. It's an earthy smell, it's like ah, oh, and that's you know you guys know more about what generates those pleasant smells, but that's just another indicator of of what you really can't see. It's kind of a, a evidence of that. Yeah, I love the smell soil too. And you kind of sometimes will get a weird look from farmers who have never picked up you know, a handful of soil and put it to their nose. But yeah, earth, that nice earthy smell is what you shoot for. And then I've also smelled soils that have that sulfury sort of rotten egg smell that can that can actually come from too anaerobic of an environment potentially. So it's funny how things that seem so simple can, can potentially tell us a lot as an indicator. Maybe not on, of course, nowhere near the DNA level of, of the information we can gather there, but still as a great indicator looking at things like earthworms and the, the smell of the soil. Um, geez, a lot of great questions, but we only have a couple more minutes. Uh, we did get asked, can you can the bee crop test differentiate fungi at the species level? And yes, we can We can look down to the species level. Um, we did in this in these slides, we looked at Bacillus and Fusarium, the genus level, but we can also go down to specific species. And then also asked, is our muscular mycorrhizal fungi population determined in bee crop tests? And yes, just like we looked at uh, and highlighted the, uh, the uh, species of Fusarium and Bacillus, we can do that for our muscular mycorrhizae. There's a, the tool in the portal has that um, built in. And then I'm glad someone asked a question about IMOs because I did want to touch on that again. Uh, they asked, Steve, are you isolating the microbes used to make your IMOs inoculant or using a co-fermentation process to grow more of them? Yeah, um, we do use a co-fermentation process over a period of 10 days to try to uh, make them multiply, of course. And then we take that soil after 10 days or so. And it's, there's a little bit of a you know, technique to do it. Keeping it moist is an obvious thing and not airtight but still you don't want it to dry out. So there's a few simple things you need to do. And then we take that, you know, once they've been multiplied, put that in a, a big tea bag, if you will, uh, into water that's aerated. And we were aerated over 24 hours. And by that time, a lot of them are swimming around in that water. 
and then we tap that water out and then that could be applied to either seed or like in my case sometimes we'll run it through drip irrigation but you got to do it right away because uh, if the water's not aerated they'll suffocate um, so but if you put them on seed when they dry they'll just go dormant right on the seed now you can't be using insecticides and fungicides and stuff like that on your seed um, it, it could kill them um, but you know there's a few little things you have to get used to and I I tell people that you know you don't want to just do this probably if you're a total fool on conventional to make that switch the, the soil may not be good enough yet for them to actually live to survive uh, and, and so this this is this is someone who's probably starting to use cover crops starting to go down the way so so they have in their new home is somewhat uh, is somewhat being developed if you will uh, is, is important I believe and I, we're still understanding trying to figure out a lot of the stuff but uh, that's a quick uh, little answer to that question. Yeah, we definitely tend to see better results from folks who are taking more of an integrative program approach to regenerative ag rather than just plugging in one thing, hoping it's going to completely transform their soil, which sometimes we might see the needle move a little and, and benefits of just, just like one biological or biostimulant, but housing those microbes, giving them the carbon they need, you know, constant root zone and influx of root exudates from a cover crop always, you know, is, is in theory going to give them more to work with. Um, I know we're we're just getting at, up to time, but one question I actually wanted to touch a little bit more, Steve, on the uh, hemp trial, and I'm glad someone asked this question because this was something I meant to touch on as we got through your uh, bee crop results and your comparison, but someone asked, how did the uh, crop yields compare uh, between your neighbor's farm and yours? How was the hemp yield? I, I believe it was last year, so uh, just curious if you, you may not have yield data top of mind, but just curious if you recall how the yields looked on those two fields. Okay, so. Um... I don't know the exact answer because you know when you take a small plot, it's uh, you know it's difficult to assign yields. Um, you know, part of this project, you know, was to to understand if there's actually differences, and we try to keep the variables as limited as possible. Um, so, I mean, as as you indicated, it was replicated. Uh, there's there were samples were taken from her within from around those plots, and that gave us a good idea that we weren't just jumping around because data is no good if it's all over the place. So I don't have a, a thing on uh, a yield data. Um, what I can tell you is because one of the things that we intentionally did is it did not put any fertility on this. Uh, and not, like there was no other outside fertilizer because we want to see the effect that wasn't you know skewed by that. So uh, there's no question that my fields yielded more. Uh, I would say significantly more, uh, but that's part of the story. But that wasn't a part of this project that we do. It would have been nice to, to actually take the yields. That would have been good. Um, and you know, in hindsight, I like, really wish I would have. Um, but uh, so the answer to the question did not take a bit. I can't tell you, but I can tell you, you know, the, 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 there, was a, there was a difference, uh, but I don't have that facts uh here to share today oh no i yeah and especially with a crop like hemp where there was also the question of not just quantity and yield but quality i figured it was hard to put numbers to it but intriguing that you had better yield overall because we did see those stronger biological nutrient cycling both np and k all showing yeah. some higher numbers uh in terms of the microbes that unlock those nutrients in your soil so um, i'd like to wrap this up well, if I could address with, with another comment because this trial that I did was also there. It was also in the context. I'm working with Penn State College of Medicine on the uh, the value of the. This was CBD hemp, by the way, but the value of the cannabinoids and the terpenes on these two, two different fields. And uh, I haven't got the results from last year yet. It takes a long time to get them out, but I've done this trial for four years, and we have seen differences of the exact same variety planted the exact same day. It is the same soil type. And yes, I gotta give credit to my neighbor who's willing to let me do this. Uh, and he's curious about it, uh, I'll just say, and intrigued. But you know, we have seen differences and that is a whole nother area. I mean, you guys are talking about what's going on in the soil. How does that affect the end product? And in, in my case here, this is hemp, but I also grow vegetables. I'm asking the question, how does growing regenerative, we'll use that term, how does that increase the I, I, I'm getting away from saying nutrient density. I'm getting away with, I'm, I'm more saying now food for health. How does that increase the health score for human consumption in this case? 
or I'm looking at the efficacy of CBD and terpenes within the hemp. So I, I'm just saying this, this uh, data that we collected here is just foundational to even more stuff we're interested in that actually directly affects you and I as human beings. Uh, and I think that's a whole nother world, a galaxy, if you will, that uh, we're just starting to get into right now. So I guess that's a good way to maybe wrap this up, thinking about what's out there in the future yet. But uh, yeah, I want to real quick. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like an awesome topic to wrap up on. I know we're a few minutes over and want to be respectful of everyone's time and, and finish things up. But that's really, I think, the ultimate question of what we're moving towards here, improved soil health leading to improved crop health. And ultimately, the question of can that ultimately support the goal of improved human health through whether you want to say increased nutrient value or increased outcomes as far as the nutritional, you know, the, the nutritional density of the crop or whatever term you might use. But really want to thank you for your time, Steve. A lot of gems of insights here as far as your cover crop use and your experiences. And just want to thank you for, you know, all the work you put into Pioneer regenerative agriculture techniques, practices, even varieties of cover crops. So thank you and, and uh, grateful that you, you know, continue to inspire growers and equip them with the tools to go down the path towards farming more in harmony with nature and ultimately promoting human soil and, and plant health. So really thank you for your time. And one last thing I want to note for audience members who submitted questions we didn't have time to get to, um, we'll read through that list and send you a personalized follow-up with an answer to your questions um, over email. So just give us a few days to get to that. But yeah, I appreciate it. Lots of great questions today. And uh, my apologies that we didn't have time to get to all of it, but appreciate it. Appreciate the discussion, the great questions. And again, thank you for your time and expertise, Steve. Always. Always great chatting with you. Bye. Bye.